I mean, literally, um, I heard uh, Trump say, I want to talk to Vladimir Putin now he's said nice things about me. So as a result of this election, you are, you have a ringside seat in the Trump presidency. You're a Russia expert. There's all this question of Trump's relationship with Putin, which still remains, you know, pretty unclear. Those meetings where he has no officials but the interpreters, he seizes the interpreters' notes. What on earth is going on? You can see what's in it for Putin, but what's in it for Trump? Well, I can tell you a little bit about all of those incidents oh, because it was a little bit more <laughs> oversight than appeared from the, um, <laughs> from the outside. But, I mean, for Trump, it's all about the image that he wants to conduct. And for him, you know, as Americans say, um, Putin's a badass, you know, the like, iconic, at least he was until he became, you know, the butcher uh, of Ukraine, the aviator sunglasses, you know, the James Bond look, they're all the various the different guys, exactly, riding, yes. which he doesn't do, thank God, anymore. Uh, it wasn't good for him to do it at the yeah, the beginning, but still, and he's yeah, had to shift somewhat. Um, and so for Trump, it's like everybody knows who Vladimir Putin is. I mean, even if they don't know his name, they go, that's that Russia guy, isn't it? You know, when people are asked on the street. And, and Trump wants that kind of respect. He wants that kind of allure. And he thinks that by being with someone or having them, you know, talk about him in a favorable way, that rubs off on him. And I'm sorry to say, I mean, it's just as, as, as primitive and as simple as that. Trump is, as we've all, you know, realized... Um, a complete narcissist, and if somebody flatters him, flattery gets them everywhere. I mean, literally, um, I heard uh, Trump, I mean, literally, well, this distance away, uh, after Putin had very deliberately um, been on Russian television and in interviews praising Trump's handling of the economy, say, I want to talk to Vladimir Putin now he's said nice things about me. So it wasn't about blackmail or any kind of other information he had on him. We've all got that information on him. It's all out there in public right now. I mean, he's got all kinds of criminal and, you yeah. know, other corruption and other, you know, trials against him. So there was no compromise as such? Well, we've got plenty of compromise. There was compromise right. about him, but we all know it as well. I mean, you know, everyone's looking about this, you know, mythical tape um, that, you know, yeah, everybody yeah. wants to hear. <laughs> but then we had there. the Access yeah. Hollywood tapes. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's plenty of, of information out there on Trump. But what Putin is very good at, coming out of the KGB and, you know, assessing his target, is figuring out what people's vulnerabilities are and what buttons he has to push. And in the case of Trump, it was the be nice to me, but and you remember um, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, you know, really courting uh, Trump, the Saudi uh, king and the family of the big gold knob, and uh, uh, just you know, kind of putting on you know big festivals and creating Trump trophies. Putin didn't do any of that, but what he did do was always talk about Trump in very favorable terms, and Trump was always talking about him as my friend. He had no personal connection with Putin; he'd never met him before. He exaggerated the nature of the relationship because he wanted people to think that he had the friends of strongmen. So he was actually anti-China, but he was pro-Xi, for example, President Xi, because President Xi was, um, you know, also a strongman. And there were several people that you would, you know, be a bit surprised. He liked the Pope. Not, not I don't think the Pope particularly liked him, but it's because he's the Pope and he loved the Queen because she's the Queen. And it's not that these, uh, you know, are either fell into the Kim strongman Jung-un. and Kim Jong Un. <laughs> And that was, um, yeah, it's also it's a, a very odd strange, dinner party. Yeah. That. It was a very odd, yeah. <laughs> I don't think, um, that'd be quite interesting, wouldn't it? But anyway, <laughs> so that was really the dynamic. And of course, for Putin, as you said, there was a lot in it for Putin because he could manipulate the situation. And I think that, you know, we all contributed to um, all of this by getting so obsessed about the whole, you know, was he the Moscow, not the Manchurian candidate? Because it was much less to it than met the eye. That was really it. And I was seeing this up front and trying to explain it to people. But everybody wanted to believe that he was being played by Putin. Everyone wanted to believe because Trump was so shocking that Tr- Putin had elected him. And of course he hadn't. Americans elected him because of the vagaries of the Electoral College. And in terms of the, these incidents, the interpreters are really highly skilled. And their notes, I mean, like journalists' notes, are in shorthand. And we did debriefs with the interpreters the instant afterwards. Trump was never alone with Putin because Trump doesn't speak Russian. You know, so um, the danger was actually with people who spoke English and would pull him apart. We have no idea about all kinds of other conversations, but we have a pretty good idea about what happened in the conversations between Trump and Putin. So I, we could happily talk for hours. We have a limited time. And I want to get on to where we are now. Yeah. Um, in- Russia, Ukraine. Was there a way of handling Putin that 
would have made any difference? Might he not have invaded? Look, I think a lot of his decision making about um, invading uh, was really influenced by COVID. And we've all been affected by COVID um, and Vladimir Putin, sadly, in ways that yeah, I think most of us, you know, are not acting out invasions of other countries as a result. Although, I mean, plenty of people felt angry about stuff during the, the COVID period, but he was in complete isolation at that time. I mean, you remember the great big long table uh, and, you know, meeting with people way over there. I mean, it doesn't really give them a lot of opportunity to give him briefings. He reduced down uh, those, a pool of people who were um, uh, providing him advice. Uh, one of the presidential um, administration units that used to kind of bundle information for him, they kind of imploded, exploded, and, you know, got uh, disbanded. And so he was just kind of meeting with close confidence that he trusted, who obviously, you know, kind of, we've seen this happen so many other times before, haven't we? You just get bad advice from the people you let uh, close to you. And other people had to quarantine for two weeks you know, before they would be allowed to see him in person. So most of the people who could have told him, really bad idea to do this, didn't get access to him and others just didn't, were too frightened to say anything. Because he seems to have been stewing in his own juices for the whole period of COVID, basically thinking about his legacy. And, you know, he's obviously trying to be president, you know, till time immemorial, but thinking about the way that he was going to be like one of the great czars. He kind of moved into this basically position of thinking himself as a character in history, in his own history, in his own narrative of Russian history, and wanting to take back Russian lands. And there was nobody really to tell him to stop. And I don't think that that's where he was headed at the very beginning of his uh, presidency. But I think that's you know, where he ended up. And COVID honestly did play a big role in that, in terms of not, there not being any check. It was, we now know, I think a lot more, and you, know, you can read about all of the papers, that you know, the people like Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, of, of, uh, an oligarch from Russia, from Ukraine rather, who was very close to him. Her, Putin's the godfather of his daughter who's telling him it'll be really easy. He, we've heard that before Iraq, you might remember, in 2003, he'll be met with flowers. You know, this was exactly what he was being told. You know, so basically, Putin is lulled into sort of thinking that he's going to literally just walk into Ukraine, or maybe a few tanks and a few convoys, and Ukraine is just going to crumble. And next thing, Ukraine is going to be joining Russia in the same way that Belarus you know, done before. Yeah, yeah. So now we have the limitless friendship between Xi Jinping and, and, and Putin. We have a United States with a serious loss of influence after Trump, now seen as an unreliable ally in many parts of the world. Yeah. So the post-war order, if you like, much discussed, it looks e extremely fragile. We're in big shifts of, of economic power, big shifts of, That's right. of, of the understanding of how you're managing uh, global affairs. You know, if you're looking at the next 10 years, what do you see? I mean, we're not going to see the same kind of hierarchical world order uh, that we've had in the past. And I don't think it's going to be one that, you know, this time around after another big you know, war in Europe that's going to be shaped by the United States alone. I mean, even in conjunction with Europeans, because, you know, you're an expert on China, you know that obviously China, you know, has its own thoughts about this. And there's all kinds of alternative orders already emerging that China is, is you know, part yeah. of BRICS, mm. you know, the, um, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, all kinds of uh, other ways of managing diplomacy and relationships. But I think what we're also seeing as a result of uh, war in Ukraine is a kind of rebellion of everyone against the United States. I mean, I'm sure there are some of you here who think, well, the United States is all to blame for this war because of NATO enlargement. Remember, countries like Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary and uh, Baltic states wanted to join NATO. And the fact that Finland and Sweden now want to join should be telling everybody something. The Finns and the Swedes were neutral for, in the Swedish case for hundreds of years. And the Finns, right up until the invasion, were saying we'd never join NATO. But then when they see what Russia is doing, you know, the Finns in particular remember that they were part of the Russian Empire. And that, you know, they uh, had uh, basically, uh, I think, a fifth of their territory taken in the Winter War in 1939, all up um, area of Karelia, north of St. Petersburg. And we think, whoa, hang on. If he's got this in his fever imagination of, you know, history of um, wanting to take back Ukraine, what if he wants to take back the Duchy of Finland? Or the Poles thinking the Grand Duchy of Warsaw? Those were also a part of the Russian Empire. And if he's saying, you know, history only began in 1783 when Russia took Crimea, what about the rest of us here? Are we going back to this age of empires? Or the bolts. So, the, exactly. Yeah. And they're saying, well, hang on a second. So, you know, we need to be doing something. This is a fight for the future of Europe with, you know, basically Vladimir Putin heading what's still the last great land empire um, in the European space. But, you know, the fact that many people think the United States did this just goes to show that there's a real backlash 
against United States influence and power. And it's highly unlikely that the United States will get the support um, to basically rethink, you know, um, institutions. I think we are still seeing, however, a great deal of interest in the United Nations, not in the United Nations Security Council, but you, you've seen all of the, and all of you have been watching these resolutions in the UN General Assembly. There still is a great deal of interest in upholding international law, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. The United States hasn't been perfect on that score, of course. But there is a lot of, the, uh, of interest in other countries of trying to reestablish, as a, uh, in the course of war in Ukraine, those basic facts. But there's not an interest in creating a new hierarchical world order. And, uh, and there's not a lot of interest in a clash between the United States and China. I think that's partly why we've seen Biden trying to patch things up a little bit and try to take down the temperature over the last couple of weeks. Because the realization that the rest of the world is not ready for another clash of the superpower titans. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.